Um, no, so we had our we had our four week uh, land initiative, and uh, last year we had put out we wanted to uh, support four families, and uh, and God uh, supernaturally doubled that, and so last year we were able to support eight families. And uh, so this year, the land team had, had opted to uh, just put out uh, a God number. They said, Lord, whatever you want to do. And, um, and so uh, things, as things began to progress, by the time uh, the four weeks were up, our, our church was able to sponsor in full, get this, 14 families. Amen. 14 families. Church, that, that amounts to about $21,000 that you contributed to pour into the lives of people in our community that will now have heat and, and food and clothing and groceries and, as well as Bibles and just be supplied, um, you know, and that's what we're called to do, right? Feed the hungry and clothe the naked, right? And so, um, so thank you for your faithfulness, your generosity, and uh, may it be returned to you a hundredfold uh, in the name of the Lord. So um, <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 17. While you're turning there, I want to just kind of pose a, a question uh, to you now that we're all kind of, where, you know, uh, hopefully shaking off the effects of tryptophan and, uh, you know, all the turkey is leaving our system. Um, I, I hope that you all had a, a, a good and wonderful Thanksgiving uh, day. But uh, let me ask you this question. And it's a bit of a rhetorical question because I know we all deal with it on some level. But have, have, you, ever, have you ever been hurt, uh, betrayed, uh, taken advantage of, taken for granted by somebody that you love and care about? And, and, and you know, some, sometimes... Uh, sometimes when we uh, go through life, we face these kinds of disappointments, and it leaves us kind of wondering why we even try sometimes. We put ourselves out there, we sacrifice, we give, and it's all just, and it, it's all just kind of taken for granted. And, you know, many of us, uh, many of you here today, you, you actually hosted Thanksgiving and uh, they say that the average host for a Thanksgiving uh, meal will add uh, in between 20 and 40 hours of preparation uh, in, in, in expectation of your guests to arrive. That's between the cleaning and the cooking and the shopping and all that is in between 20 to 40 hours on top of your normal schedules. And in addition to that, the average, the average uh, host uh, will spend about three hundred and fifty dollars uh, in uh, in preparing for uh, preparing for all their guests to come, and for all of those efforts and for all of those expenses, you're inviting all the crazy people in your family to come to your house, which every other day of their year you avoid, but you're opening them, uh, opening up your doors for them to come in. And statistics, the latest statistics show that for your 40 hours of contribution, you will get to spend in between two and a half to four hours with that family member. And oftentimes families will gather and when they do, old issues inevitably erupt. Um, political divides uh, can, can cause heated debate uh, inside of these kinds of gatherings. Even religious tensions uh, can begin to cause friction uh, around your Thanksgiving table. And unfortunately for some, Thanksgiving isn't Thanksgiving until the police arrive and break everything up. And so sometimes when we put ourselves out there with the best of intentions, um, it, it, it gets blown up back in our face and we can just sit back and say, why do I even try? Why do I put myself out there? Why do I set myself up for such disappointment? And I wanted to pose that thought because I wonder if you've ever wondered why Jesus even tries with us sometimes. Because too often our reactions to life and our grumbling and our dissatisfactions and our frustrations, for all that Jesus has done for us, for all that he has invested in us, for all that he has paid for, 
for us. I wonder if he ever just sits back and say, why do I even try? Why even go through this? And today, even though we have cross the threshold of November and we're now into December and, 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 and we'll start gearing, our, uh, gearing our, our messages and our focus and we've already got these beautiful decorations. Thank you uh, for all those who did that and, and, uh, and, and, and we'll start thinking about Christmas. I wanted to talk to you one more time about the subject of Thanksgiving and, and not Thanksgiving in the holiday sense, but Thanksgiving in a heart sense. Uh, Thanksgiving all year around. And so I want to examine the Bible and one of the uh, passages that the Bible talks about Thanksgiving is found in Luke 17. We're going to begin reading in verse 11 and it's the story of the 10 lepers. It reads this way. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into the village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priests. And they went and they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? He is no one, has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner. And then he said to him, rise and go your faith has made you well. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, because at your word, healing takes place. At your word, creation comes to being. At your word, all the brokenness becomes healed. Thank you, Jesus, that at the power of your word, Lord, that, that we can see our sin, uh, Lord, be transformed into righteousness. And I pray today, God, that you would open up our hearts' doors. And God, that we would open up our spiritual ears. That we might hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. And we give you the praise in Christ's name. Amen. 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 So basically what's happening here is Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. It, it, Jesus is a teacher. He's a rabbi. And he's on his way to the holy city. And on the way, he's on this, this path that separates Samaria from Galilee. And he had traveled, if you read the, the works of Jesus, you know that he traveled this path often. And he had done many miracles along this, along this path. And a lot of ministry in this route. And along the way, he comes upon what was called a leper colony. And in this colony, there were 10 lepers, men that were afflicted with deadly diseases. And they, they approach Jesus and they cry out uh, to him. Now, what we know about the lepers is this. We know that there were 10, uh, nine of them were Jewish and one was a Samaritan. And it's important to note that under any other circumstance in life, these nine Jews would have absolutely zero communication or affiliation with a Samaritan. There would be, there would be no uh, there would be no crossing of these ethnic and religious lines between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans viewed, uh, uh, or the, uh, the, the Jews viewed Samaritans as pagans. And, 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 uh, and they, they, on the uh, social ladder, they considered a Samaritan one step below a stray dog. That, that's that's the, the, the depths to which they felt toward the Samaritans. So the fact that all of them are together is very unique. Now, Jews, when they would travel, they would go through great lengths to circumvent Samaria. That they would do whatever they could. They would be like, if you so hated going through New York City, like travel around can to Canada, right? to get around it. This is what they would do because they just felt like even the, the soil that they walked in was so tainted. But the funny thing is, is that the Jewish community and the Samaritan community 
had very common roots. They had very common heritage. They, and, and yet they preferred to feel as if they had nothing in common at all. Sounds a lot like the racial divides that we experience even today. And, and church, I want to tell you this, that despite all their differences, something brought these nine Jews and this one Samaritan into community together. Something, actually four things, brought, brought this, these nine Jews and this one Samaritan into the same community. So what did they have in common? The first thing that they had in common was all 10 of them were suffering the same fate. They were suffering the same fate. They all were lepers. They had leprosy. Now, in that day, leprosy was the most feared illness of the day. The term leprosy used in the Bible is found all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. And, it, and it's used to describe infectious skin rashes, sores, scales, eruptions. It's not the clinical form of leprosy that we know today that is treated with, um, with antibiotics. But in verse 12, it's interesting. Verse 12 says this. It says, these 10 lepers, but by, by the way, let me just say this about leprosy. Leprosy changed their identity. No longer were they Jew or Samaritan. In fact, these men were not even considered human. They didn't even have names. They were just called leper. And when somebody came walking by, they had to, they had to cry out, unclean, unclean, and let people know that I am infected. Stay away from me. And so, and so the Bible tells us in verse 12 that they all stood at a distance. They, they had to stand at a distance from Jesus. They were not allowed to come to kneel to him. They were not allowed to come and touch him. They were not allowed to come near anybody because the law stated that if you had leprosy, you had to stay six feet away from everybody else. This included your wife, your husband, your children. You, you were not allowed to get in close proximity. And if you did, the person that you got in close proximity to would now be considered unclean and be cast out of the city alongside you. Lepers were not allowed within the walls of the city ever. The law demanded that they were cast out and avoid everyone. We find this in the book of Leviticus. Uh, these are called the, the Mosaic Scriptures or the Torah. And the book of Leviticus, the third book of the Bible gives us what's called the Levitical laws or the laws of the Levites. And so this law in chapter, um, in chapter 13 of the book of Leviticus, uh, verse 46, tells us, it says, the leper shall live alone, his dwelling shall be outside the camp. And so they had suffered all kinds of agony. They were suffering all kinds of affliction, all kinds of disappointments and pain. And all 10 men, regardless of their backgrounds, regardless of who they know, regardless of their wealth or their political position, regardless of their pedigree, all 10 of them were now in a hopeless situation. They were suffering the common fate. They, they were all in this colony to die. And die they would, a painful lonely, disgusting, and embarrassing death. But while they all had the same fate, they also say, all shared the same need for a common freedom. They had the same fate that needed the same freedom. You see, as I mentioned before, there, at that day, there was no known cure for this disease. That's why they just put you out in the city, out of the city. The Jews viewed, if you contracted leprosy, uh, the Jews would say that you are cursed by God. In other words, they would say, you must have done something so vile, so evil, that God has cursed you with this, and you're getting what you deserve. This was part of their culture. This was part of their teaching. This is what people thought, okay? And so, and so if you got leprosy, it stands to reason that as a Jew, you would, you would say to yourself, well, I'm just getting what I deserve. And, and so they, they were in bondage. 
They were in bondage to a sickness. And listen, we all know what it's like to be in bondage to sicknesses. I, I, I'll tell you, it's the craziest thing. I mean, it's like I woke, I, I, I exercise and I work out harder than I have in my whole life. And I've got more aches and pains than I've ever had in my whole life. I got knees, I got, I got joints that I didn't even know I had that hurt all the time. And, and, and it's like this affliction and it just reminds me all the time, oh yeah, I'm here. You know what I'm talking about, right? You, you, many of you did your trees this week, right? And you went to go get all the supplies out of the attic and you went to pick up things and you're like, oh, I used to be able to lift that, you know? And, and so we're reminded and we're, and we're caught, caught up in the bondage of these afflictions and this sickness. And, but this sickness, this, this agonizing disease changed their life forever. And the truth is, is that none of these guys, no matter how heinous their lives may have been, no matter what they did, this wasn't something that God caused upon them, and they certainly didn't ask for it. I mean, did anybody just ever wake up one day and say, you know, God, I really just want a life-changing illness. Would you just afflict me with something horrible? No, they didn't ask for this. this, this where did this come? They probably were pretty good guys. They probably were, were working professionals with, you know, with a, a modest living and a nice family and just trying to make ends meet and had community and, and visited synagogue and, and did all the right things and, and probably were really good guys. They probably spent a lot of time, though, in this colony wondering, and here it is, how could this happen to me? You ever ask yourself that? How could this, ha how could this happen to me? Uh, church, I will tell you, I stand before you today, a man who has said this many times in my life. I remember what it was like the day that I got the news that after 25 years of beautiful Christian marriage, model marriage, my parents were getting a divorce. How could this happen to me? I remember what it was like to, to, to cry with my wife on the news of our miscarriage thinking about all the dreams that we had for that child and, and, and what had happened and, and, and navigating through that. How could this happen? We are good people. How could this happen to us? I remember how I felt and how I questioned things when Jeanette five years ago was diagnosed with cancer. How can this happen to me? I know what it's like, church, to be betrayed and hurt deeply by people that I look up to and that I respected. How can that happen to me? I've been in those times where you feel so beaten down and so helpless that you find it hard to breathe, much less be strong. How can that happen to me? And see, church, one day these men, they were simply working to try to ease their physical pain. They were just trying to get through another day of this dreadful disease. And they were trying just to deal with the emotional and the mental agony and the pain that came with the rejection that their communities had displayed upon them. It's another day of dealing with heart wrenching pain of being unable to ever be close to your spouse again, to be unable to ever kiss your children again, to be unable to ever be looked at in the eyes of a beholder who says you are beautiful because of the disfiguration that this disease has caused upon your body. Never being able to enjoy life normally again. It was just another day for them dealing with all that wondering how could this happen to me and on that day this this man Jesus comes walking down the road that separates Samaria from Galilee and and these like I mentioned before he'd done lots of ministry along this this path so it stands to reason that these men had probably heard the name Rabbi Jesus before they'd probably heard about his great miraculous works they'd probably heard about his kindness and his love and and his and his grace and his mercy and so the Bible tells us in verse 13 that they all all of them called out in a loud voice and they said, Jesus, master, have pity on us. Have mercy on us. They cried out to him, desperation. I feared that too many people today only cry out to Jesus 
when they're in a desperate state. But what's so great about God, what's so great about Jesus is that even, even then Jesus will stop his journey to listen. And they cried out, free us, have mercy on us. What they're saying is we need freedom from this fate. You see, church, other rabbis, piously religious people had told them that this disease was what they deserved. They believed that they were getting what they deserved. But what I love about mercy is that mercy says, I'm not going to grant you what you deserve. I'm going to protect you from what you deserve. That's what mercy is. When you have mercy on somebody, you are, you are protecting them from what they deserve. They knew that Rabbi Jesus would give them mercy. He would have mercy upon them. So they asked him for mercy. They said, they, and, and he healed uh, them that they, they, that, they, that, they, that they knew that they would not be getting what they thought they deserved. So they cried out loudly to him for mercy because they had a common fate, this, this disease, and they needed a common freedom. They needed to be free from it. And because of that, it welled up inside of them, nine Jews and one Samaritan, it welled up inside of them a common faith, a common faith. They, they must have heard of the authority and the power of Jesus. They must have heard about his compassion before. So they exercised faith together. And in verse 14 says this, it says, when he saw them, he held a revival service and they had a worship service and he had an altar call and he called them all forward and they laid hands on them and they were healed. It does not say that. What it says that Jesus did, Jesus didn't go to them. Jesus did not hug them. Jesus did not tell them it was going to be okay. Jesus did not console them. He didn't even pray for them. Jesus gave them his word. And he said this, go and show yourself to the priests. And they went and they were all cleansed. Now church, I want you to understand something. The law, as we stated before, commanded that they had to stay six feet away. So if Jesus had touched them, he would have been in violation of the law too. So he tells them to do what the law orders them to do. When you feel that you were healed of leprosy, you go and you see the priest and then the priest will examine you and he will determine whether or not you can be reinstated into society. That was the Old Testament law that was prescribed to a person who felt they were healed from leprosy. Now, notice the 10 lepers continued to demonstrate, this is so powerful, so please capture this, that they continued to demonstrate their faith together and, they, and they, they were demonstrating that they had faith in the words of Jesus. Go and show yourself to the priest. And what did they do? They turned immediately and they went toward the city and headed toward the priest. And they still had leprosy. They had not been healed yet. Jesus said, go and show yourself. Their faith came when they obeyed his word. He did not heal them. And then they say, go and see the priest. The Bible says, go and show yourself to the priest. And as they were on their way, they were all healed. Church, how powerful of a message and a lesson is that for us, that we must just be obedient to the word of God, even when the conditions do not show that God's anywhere to be found. And so they didn't question Jesus. They obeyed him and they were all cleansed. And because they had experienced a common fate, needed a common freedom and exercised a common faith and all of them were healed. Now, I wish that was the end of the story, but it's not. Now it's when it gets really complicated. Not complicated, it gets kind of exciting. They're, 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 because everything to this point has been common, but now they share something that's uncommon. They had an uncommon fracture in their friendship. You see, even though these nine Jews and this one Samaritan had so many common experiences that pulled them together across generation and prejudice and, and, and religious divide, something in the end separated them. Now they're all healed. Now they're all 
healed. Something pulled this 10-member gang apart because only one of them returned to Jesus, the Samaritan. And you say, well, what, why? What is, it that, that, what is it that created such a division? Was it their ethnicity? Maybe. It could have been, it could have been that the Jews knew that, man, I, I was just healed of physical leprosy, but if I hang out with this Samaritan, I'm going to commit, I'm going to uh, gain social leprosy. I'm going to be, I'm going to be ostracized again because of my affiliation with the Samaritan. Maybe it was their religion itself that fractured this relationship. I want you to notice something. Verse 14, Jesus told them, go and show yourself to who? The priest. What religion is the priest? He's Jewish. He's a Jewish priest. So he's in the temple of Jerusalem. Jesus told all 10 of them, go to the temple of Jerusalem and see the Jewish priest, Samaritan. Think of this. If you're the Samaritan, did you know that there was, there was a wall in Jerusalem called the dividing wall? <laughs> How racist is that? <laughs> and, they, and, they, and, the, and on the wall, there was a carved inscription that said, let no foreigner, everybody say foreigner. foreigner. Let no foreigner enter within the screen and enclosure surrounding the sanctuary. In other words, if you ain't Jew, you can't come through. <laughs> and so verse 18, verse 18 says this, the, the Samaritan returns to Jesus and Jesus says, was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner. Now, the word foreigner that Jesus used here is the Greek word alaganas. And it's, it's the w same word that was inscribed on the wall, on the dividing wall, foreigner. And, and, and so it, th this word describes who could not enter, yet the one that could not enter was the only one that came and said thank you to Jesus. And it gives us great insight into the heart of this Samaritan because this Samaritan, listen to this, this is so powerful. This Samaritan took Jesus at his word. He took him at his word and the, the, the Samaritan followed the Jews and he began a journey toward the priest that he knew he would never finish. He would never, there was no way he was ever going to get through that wall. There was no way he was ever going to see that priest. He's a Samaritan, but he obeyed Jesus anyway. Church, when the situations and the circumstances look impossible, but the Holy Spirit prompts you to do something, our job is not to question the circumstances. Our job is to say, yes, Lord, and obey him with a, with a childlike faith. And so he took Jesus at his word. And, and church, the, after all the healing, they were all healed. All 10 of them, the Bible tells us, they were all healed. Nine, the nine Jews still had to present themselves to the priests and they were reinstated into society. The nine Jews had to fulfill the law so that they could be considered good Jews. But the one Samaritan had nowhere to go. He had nowhere to go. So what do you do when you got nowhere to go? You go to Jesus. And so he goes back to Jesus. And he understood that no priest would ever be able to declare him free from his fate. But his faith his faith in Jesus made him free from his fate. His faith in Jesus was the source of his healing. Jesus was the one who showed him the mercy and protected him from what he thought he deserved. He, he, he guarded him. So the Samaritan only wanted to go to one place, back to Jesus. Now you might say, well, why didn't the other nine? What happened to the other guys? Why didn't the other nine go, go back to, to Jesus too? And I don't know, we can only speculate. Maybe, maybe they wanted to go visit their families first and say, look, I'm healed. The priest, has, the priest has freed me. Maybe they thought that Jesus had no power at all. He just instructed them to go to the priest. Maybe they, maybe they, they attributed all of their healing to the power of the priest. May, maybe they thought, well, I was kind of getting better anyway. And, and, and uh, Jesus maybe just saw that. I, who knows what went through their heads, why they didn't come back. We can only speculate. But the greatest cause to separate the Samaritan from the nine Jews 
was his thankful heart. That's what separates them. It's an attitude of thanksgiving that swelled up inside of this man. He was so thankful to Jesus that he had to immediately go back to him. It was the thankfulness of the Samaritan that set him apart, and he severed, it severed him from the other nine. Hey, church, can I just tell you something? When you, this is so true, and if you walk through this, you know what I'm talking about. You can hang with your homies all that you want, but when you get to the point where you leverage everything in your heart and your life as thanksgiving unto God for the big things and the little things, it's because of the Lord. I thank you, Jesus. I give thanks for this meal. I thank you that I could put my head down at night. I thank you, Lord. When you start having a truly thankful heart in every situation, it will sever you from the crowd. It just will. And there's times where even good people don't want to be around you because they would rather complain and they would rather gripe because birds of a feather flock together. And church, the, but here's, here's the key. He wasn't just thankful. He was so, so thankful. And I'm going to explain to you what that means here in a minute. But first, I want you to understand he got to do two things that the others didn't get to do. The Samaritan first got to touch Jesus. The Bible says that, that in this first interaction with Jesus, Jesus just spoke to them. They obeyed his word and he went and he was healed. But now he's no longer unclean. Now he's healed of his affliction. He doesn't need a priest to tell him this. And the Bible says in verse 16 that he came to Jesus and he threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him and he was a Samaritan. You gotta understand something. This was not like Western law, and there was no, there was, the, the, the court system was a little bit different then. If you were a Samaritan and you touched a Jewish priest, that was an immediate infraction and could be punishable by death. You do not just go touch the priest. You don't just go touch the, the rabbi. And, and so he gets to touch Jesus. The Bible says that he threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. He touched him. He touched him. He was truly free. You know how free you've got to feel to just be completely uh, uh, oblivious to all the, the law and the pomp and the circumstance and just, and just be like, Jesus! You know how free you've got to feel inside of your heart to be to that point where you don't care what other people think anymore, where you're not concerned about the consequences. All you want to, all you want to do is to make sure that Jesus knows how thankful you are. Do you know how free you have to be inside of your heart to do that? This man was free. He was free from bondage of, of ethnic lines, free from the things that had shackled him his whole life. He was free from the sickness that had now defined him and changed him. The, he was free from being unclean. He was free from the weight of doubt, free from disillusionment, free from defeat, free from, free from all of this. And that's what brought him to Jesus because he was free. I mean, really free church. He was totally, totally free. Oh, don't we long to be free? And scripture says that that's why Jesus even came. You realize that the Bible tells us in the book of Galatians that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. He, so that why? So that we would not be uh, yoked again or bound again to the yoke of slavery. He doesn't want us to go back and to, and, to, and to be in bondage again. He wants you to live free. And church, I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, 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 you wanna know what's gonna mark, uh, make a marked difference in your life as a believer is, when, is when, you, when you really grasp onto 2 Corinthians 3, 17, which tells us that where the spirit of God is made Lord, there is freedom. And I mean real freedom in your life. And most of you here, you know what that means. You know how to experience that. You know what, you know what it's like to, to, to have been bound to something all your life. You're good people. You did good things, but there's something that you've been in bondage to. There's something that has weighed you down. But man, when you met Jesus, it freed you. So he threw himself at Jesus' feet. The second thing that ha happens, not only he, he was the only one that got to touch Jesus, the second thing that happens is this. Of all of them that were healed, he was the only one that was made well. 
He was the only one that was made well. The Bible says in verse 19, he said to them, rise and go because your faith has made you well. The word well is the Greek word sozo. And it's the same word that is used in the New Testament to describe salvation. It's being set free spiritually, forgiveness from your sins. It's what defines a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the promise of eternal life in heaven. Here I want you to see a a profound and, and powerful truth, church. Ten men healed. Ten men set free from the common fate. Ten men that are totally walking free from their physical afflictions. They had all that in common. But now, even though they were all healed, there's only one that is sozo. There's only one that is well. The the Samaritan had so much in common with his Jewish counterparts, but he was the only one who was eternally saved, healed, not just in his body, but in his spirit too. Oh, church, does this get you a little excited? Because you don't sound it. I will tell you, I read this and I start and I start doing that little dance in my office and it gets a little bit faster and then my knees remind me not to do that anymore. And then I say, woo! Sozo, sozo. The one difference between being healed and being well was a heart of thanksgiving. The heart of thanksgiving. It's the fundamental key that moves us from just being healed to being well. You see, the problem, the problem is for so many, they just want to be healed. But it's not enough, church. We need more than just healing. We need to be well. That's why that, 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 great, that great hymn, it is well with my soul. It's not, it is, my soul is healed. It doesn't even flow. My soul is healed. It doesn't, it doesn't even work. It's like a bad trumpet. That's just me singing. It is well. It's well with my soul. It is well. So the question this morning, this, this Sunday after Thanksgiving, the the first Sunday in December as we move headlong into the Christmas season is, is this. Is it well with your soul? Is your, is your soul well? Because listen, we can, have, we can be in the tip-top physical condition. We can be at the top of our game uh, in our job and in our performance. We can have the sharpest minds in the world. But if your soul is still in bondage, it's not well. And it will do nothing. It will do nothing for you on the judgment day. Our soul is what matters at the end of it all. When everything else burns away, all that's going to exist is the condition of your soul. And my question to you today is, is it sozo? Are you thankful for what Jesus has done for you? So thankful that you wake up every day and you're driven because you know that God has a purpose and a plan for your life and he went to the nth degree to pay for that. Are you, are you thankful in your heart or do you take for granted the sacrifice that Christ, the investment that Christ has made in your life? Because I will tell you, Jesus never once, never once has he said, why, did I, why do I even bother? I will tell you, they, if you've been in church for any measure of time, you've heard pastors say that had you been the only one, Jesus would have given his life for you. That's 100% true. He would have given your life for you because you matter that much to him. Is it well with your soul? Is it well? I want to ask Mike if he'd make his way up here. And as he's coming, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Because as we close this morning, I want, I want to draw your attention to some striking similarities between the lepers and our own life. You see, as I mentioned in the beginning of this sermon, and you agreed, that we hate to be taken for granted. And we get angry sometimes when we sacrifice and nobody says thanks. Thanks. And I pose the question, have you ever thought how Christ, who died on the cross, 
and paid so much for us must hate our ingratitude. See, we have so much to be thankful for today because you and I share a common fate. We all, we all are in this colony together because we have been infected by the leprosy of sin. Sin, nobody escapes sin's grip. And listen, your, your dear grandmother that baked all those pies this week, that is just sweet as butter, like that woman has sin in her life. I know, it's hard to believe. But it's true. We all suffer from the same leprosy of sin. It's what brings us all together. It's what we have in common. It's what, it's what has put us together in this place because we all suffer from it. It's a disease that has contaminated each one of us and it can cause us to be outcasts from the camp of God. It's a disease that is fatal to the soul and there's no cure for it except from the great physician. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. Nobody escapes it. So because we have that common fate, it, it, it ha there's a result. Romans 6.23 tells us that the cost, the price for that sin is death. That word death there is eternal death. It's damnation. It is, it is a fiery death in hell. And that common fate that brought us together, something in us sparked enough in us that, that, that caused us to call upon Jesus. And most of you at one point in your journey has done that. Jesus came walking along your life's path and you cried out to him, Jesus, Jesus, forgive us. Jesus, save us. And something caused you to seek out the possibility of mercy from this man, Jesus. And it's a good thing because though Romans 6 tells us that the wages of sin is death, it says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So each person in this room has a certain measure of faith. That's also the word of God, that we all have a measure of faith. If you didn't have some measure of faith, you wouldn't be here. If you didn't have some measure of faith, you wouldn't have listened to me go on for and on and on and on. You're like, Pastor, the snow's coming. <laughs> Made me cancel my third service. <laughs> but we all share a common freedom. That's also what draws us together. It's a need for salvation. A freedom that comes by faith by faith in Jesus and, and having him wash your sins away. A freedom that comes as we begin our journey down a, down a path commanded for us in scripture. And if we believe in Jesus and begin to walk that narrow path, we know that his blood has cleansed the leper, leprosy of our souls. And he has come to make you and I clean today. He has granted you mercy today. He has freed you from your fate today. The Bible says this, you are sozo by his grace, right? Through our faith in Jesus Christ. You are saved. You're set free through your, through the, through the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. Him not just protecting you from what you deserve, but also blessing you with things that you don't deserve. Like eternity in heaven and a life more abundantly, a fully alive, John 10, 10, Zoe life. None of us deserve that, but he gives it to us and he grants it to us. Why? Because he is a good, good father. And, and I will tell you, church, there's one thing, there's one thing that will set us apart. There's one thing that will set us apart from the world. And that is very simple. Are you thankful for what he has done? Or do you just take his sacrifice on the cross for granted? What does that cross mean to you? Is it a piece of jewelry that you wear around your neck or on your ears? Or does it, or is it the is it the pathway? Is it the thing that had to happen? It is a it is a horrific symbol of a terrific act that saved us and set us free. Jesus paid that 
price for us. So church, my challenge to you is to have a thankful heart. And when you do, you will be so, so free. So free. So saved. So complete. And forever. It's an abundant life. Because you get to touch the heart of God. You get to touch him. Like the woman with the issue of blood in scripture. Remember that? She elbowed her way. She said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just get close enough to Jesus, everything will be fine. And it was. And that, that lesson is true for us. If you can just get close enough to him, if you can just get in close enough proximity to Jesus, if I can be in the same place that Jesus is, it's going to all be okay. So I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. We're we're about to close out. We're going to close out in a prayer. I'm going to ask you to all say this prayer with me. But before we pray, I want to ask you in in the solitude of this moment, with your eyes closed and your heads bowed, if you're here today and you say, Pastor Chris, you know what? I maybe you are a good person. Maybe you do a lot of good things. Maybe, maybe you. Maybe you're an upstanding citizen and, you, and, and you're, you're, you're active and you in community and you help people and you sacrifice and you give and you volunteer. Maybe you do all those things, but you still know that there's, there is something tugging inside of your heart. And I will tell you today, it is the leprosy of sin and it cannot, it cannot be squelched by your own self-righteousness. It only comes through the righteousness of God, through the blood of Jesus that covers a multitude of sin. That's the only way, that's the only way that the sin issue is dealt with. And so maybe when we pray, I'm praying for you. Or maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Chris, I am so far away from God and I have done so many horrible things. I, I've made way more mistakes and I've made good decisions in my life. I am too, maybe you feel like you're too far gone for Jesus to stop and pay attention to you. But may I submit to you today that there is no depth too deep that Jesus won't stop. Jesus stopped at a leper colony and talked to 10 men and they were all set free. Church, the reason why the Bible doesn't go into description of these men's past is because the past didn't matter. What they had done up to the intersection of Jesus had had no bearing on what was gonna happen after. Jesus was there to heal them and to deliver them of that deadly disease and to offer them salvation regardless of their past. That's why the Bible tells us that when we receive Jesus, that the old things pass away and all things become new. You start on a journey of righteous living. You start on a journey of right decisions as the Holy Spirit leads you and guides you. So I will tell you today, no matter where you're at on that spectrum, this prayer is for you if you are suffering from that sin leprosy issue. If there is, if you have not submitted your heart in, uh, fully to Jesus today, then this prayer is for you. We're going to all pray it together. But I wonder with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you're here today and when we pray, you say, Pastor, when you pray, you're praying for me. You would simply be humble enough to raise your hand so I know who we're praying with today and say, that's me, Pastor. I I need this prayer today. Would you just shoot your hand up just so I know who we're praying with today uh, before, before we go? Thank you. Anybody else join this woman? Thank you in the back. Thank you again. Anybody else? Thank you, young lady to my right. Anybody else? Who will join these three? Thank you, sir. In the center here. I'll hang up. Thank you in the back. Anybody else? I just need to say that prayer. I need to say that prayer. Okay. I want everybody just to repeat after me. Say, dear Jesus, I'm here today and you see the sin in my life. I admit I'm a broken person, but I know that you died on the cross and gave your life for my forgiveness. So today, I ask you, forgive me of my sins. I want to live my life to please you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's rejoice together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. Come on, thank him. Give him praise today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Before we go, two orders of business. Number one, if you said that prayer, you raised your hand, or, or maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you said it, and you made that commitment today, please find one of our prayer partners. There, they've got, they just have information they want to put in your hands. Number two, if you said that prayer today, please know the Bible's clear that your name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life in heaven. The Bible says that there is a party going on right now on your honor because of the, because of the, the, the decision that you made today. So rejoice in that. Have an awesome week. Enjoy shoveling the snow. Get your fire started. We'll see you guys next week. God bless you.